Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Emily Ringer with Polar Bears International, and I am coming to you from the UN Climate Talks in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt. And today we have a very special program for you because we are connecting two places that are super different, uh, but have uh, one big thing in common. And so I'd like to introduce my uh, co hosts today and uh, panelists, also Steve and Elisa. Uh, to introduce our other location. Hi, Emily. Elisa, Thanks so starting. much for connecting with us today. It's so cool to talk to you from Churchill all the way over in Egypt there. So I'm Elisa. I'm a staff scientist at Polar Bears International, Director of Conservation Outreach, and I'm joined by our fabulous chief scientist, Steve. I'm Steve Amstrup, and I am the chief scientist at Polar Bears International, and Elisa and I are going to be talking about polar bears from right here live on the uh, shores of Hudson Bay where uh, the polar bears are waiting uh, for an opportunity to get back out onto the sea ice where they uh, need to be in order to catch their sealed prey. Absolutely. Yeah, Emily, I bet it's a little bit colder here than it is where you are today. Uh, the winds have been howling. There's snow on the ground. It's at least minus 10 Celsius out here. But it's been a beautiful day. We've been watching polar bears all morning. We've had sparring. We've had a mom with cubs. And it's just been really neat to, to see the bears today all around us here on the shores of Hudson Bay. And then we're, you know, thinking of you at the same time in a very different location. Yes, yes, it, it is, is not, not snowy, snowy here. here. <laughs> it is very, uh, quite warm, dusty, uh, beautiful mountains around. The Sinai Mountains are on the edge of Sharm El Sheikh, but very uh, different landscape than what I can see out behind you. Obviously, that's not what you're seeing here. I am in one of the conference halls at the moment. And I can kind of start because I feel like this context can be kind of confusing. So I'll give everyone a little bit of an idea for what this space is and why I'm joining my colleagues from so far away. So I'm at COP27 and this is the annual meeting of about 197 na nations that come together to talk about climate change and to make plans for addressing it. And this is organized by the United Nations. And this is our seventh year, our seventh year uh, coming to COP27. It's a very, uh, it's only my second year here, but it's a very vibrant and interesting place because everyone's here to talk about the same issue, but they're sharing very different parts of the story. So as Polar Bears International, our role here is to come as an accredited observer organizer. So, it's not just governments that are here right now, it's also uh, members of the press, members of nonprofits or non-governmental organizations like ourselves, members of intergovernmental organizations and members of civil society. And those of us that are part of this pool of observers are really important because observers play a balancing role with government interests. So observers, tend to highlight frontline community stories, which are super, a really, really important part of the climate crisis. Uh, they offer unique experience. And then they also can set the bar of for action very high and make it very clear that expectations for addressing this, this crisis uh, are, are high and unshakable. And it's up to governments and bears to try their best to match that challenge. So Elisa and Steve. Oh, can everyone hear me? Yes. You're loud and clear on our yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. great. Excellent. I My Wi-Fi is a little bit shaky, everyone, so bear with me if I go in and out, but it seems like I'm hearing everyone now. So because what happens in Sharm El Sheikh here is so connected to uh, polar bears that are outside the or Steve and Elisa right now, and the environment that they are around. We wanted to bring these two these two spaces into one webcast. And Steve, I'm hoping that you can give us the polar bear specific element of this. Uh, we're talking about climate change. Why is it that polar bears are so threatened by climate change? So polar bears depend on the sea ice to catch their prey. So what exactly does that mean? You know, a lot of people hear, oh, well, polar bears depend on the ice, but they don't really understand that. So polar bears can really only uh, 
predictably feed from the surface of the sea ice where they catch principally two species of seals and because polar bears can't swim as well as the seals their strategy is to catch them when they're available through breathing holes and maybe hauled out on the surface of the ice where the polar bears live. Uh, when the ice is gone, the polar bears can't swim out in the ocean with the free swimming seals and catch them, so they come ashore in here on the shores of Hudson Bay and they're basically food deprived. And uh, they, uh, studies have shown that they lose about a kilogram of body weight every day that they're on shore and the period that they're on shore is getting progressively longer. Uh, they're coming ashore uh, earlier now and they're leaving and going back out onto the sea ice later and about that, that, uh, that gap between when the ice goes out and uh, when uh, it comes back in is uh, about a month longer than it used to be say in the late 80s. So the bears are having to fast for a longer period and they uh, uh, have a shorter period on the ice in which to gain weight. So it's kind of a double whammy for them and what we're doing right now is we're watching bears that are waiting here at the shore of the bay uh, hoping that the ice is going to freeze up so that they can get back out and start hunting seals again. And was that a live bear that we were seeing on the cam just there right outside, outside your window? window? Yeah, the sleeping bear. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they were, uh, we had a couple of bears outside the window sparring a little bit ago. They were on the camera sparring, but uh, they're now taking a break. One of them has moved away and the other one is still right uh, near the buggy, just uh, uh, kind of taking a snooze there. And, you know, so that brings up another point, Emily, is that most of the time when these bears are on shore and there's not much for them to eat, they're resting. They're sleeping most of the time. They're conserving energy because they're not sure how long it's gonna be before the ice comes back in. And uh, they need to make sure that they save enough of their energy uh, so that they can get back out and feed when uh, the ice does come in. Yes, thank you, Steve. And that really does illustrate why or just how closely these issues, I mean, these issues are, are are intertwined and cannot be untangled. And so what is happening here with world leaders gathering to discuss climate change and what addressing that will look like has a direct impact on this bear that we're seeing right here on, well, has a direct impact on the species <laughs> at large and the ecosystem that it depends on. And as you can probably all imagine, so this space, you know, there are our representatives from 197 countries and then all of the other people that I mentioned. And to coordinate between you know, 197 countries is pretty complex. And so the goals of this meeting every year, you know, this is the 27th meeting, and the goals of this meeting change a little bit every year depending on where, where nations are at in global progress towards addressing climate change. So this, this year here, is our first year of really implementing the Paris Agreement. And really what that means is just that last year, the plan for addressing climate, climate change between these 197 countries was finalized. We made a plan, we identified all the key players, we made a rule book for it to make sure that we understood uh, what was and wasn't allowed in the plan. And that was finalized last year. And now this is the first year that we actually get to put that plan into action. And there are a variety of priorities within that plan for addressing climate change. And one of the biggest ones is uh, reducing global emissions so that to keep the planet to warming at two degrees Celsius, but ideally 1.5 degrees Celsius. And so Steve, I'd like to bring it back to you because as you know, we've stated, the state of polar bears and the state of sea ice is is intertwined with the climate. Uh, they have a direct relationship. And you know, what are these what are these numbers like two degrees and or no action at all or one point five, what do they really mean for for polar bears across the Arctic? Well so if uh, if you think about it, the polar bears depend on sea ice and ice melts as the temperature rises. So polar bears habitat is 
uh, that is directly and obviously related to the changing temperature. Uh, but what we have to uh, realize is that we have great control over just how fast the, world's, the world warms. One thing that we can say that's positive about uh, uh, global warming and the climate changes that it's resulting in is that we actually caused this problem. Because we caused it, we can solve it. But in order to solve it, we have to get on a different warming trajectory. And our studies uh, suggest that if we are able to keep global temperature rise to something between one and a half and two degrees uh, Celsius, that we will save polar bears over much of their current range. Perhaps not in every subpopulation, but over most of their current range. And if we were to do that, we of course would benefit the rest of life on Earth because polar bears may be experiencing these changes more rapidly than the rest of the world, but those changes are coming to all of us. Now, if we allow the world to warm more rapidly, if we allow the, you know, currently we're on a path, I think most people will say, of about three degrees uh, temperature rise uh, by the end of the century. If we were to remain on that path or one of the warmer paths that we've been on in the past, what's often called business as usual, uh, either of those paths ultimately into the future would uh, do away with polar bears because they would lose all of their sea ice habitat. Uh, I'm really hopeful that we don't get to that point because not only do I not want to see us lose polar bears, I don't want polar bears to go the way of the dinosaur. And uh, the other thing, of course, even more importantly, is the impact that those kinds of high temperatures would mean for humans all around the world and, of course, all of the other species that we care about. Yes, absolutely. That's well said, Steve. Climate really threatens ecosystems and communities around the world. And while we, it may impact us all at different times and in slightly different ways, uh, it's nobody and no ecosystem is immune to it. Uh, Elisa, do you have anything to add to that? That was pretty complete, but want to give you a chance to chime in. To talk about Steve as such a fabulous example of how one individual can make such an impact in the world. Steve's always worked with amazing teams of people, but it was really Steve that had this passion to protect the polar bears and drove the listing of polar bears as threatened on the endangered species list. And it was because of his tenacity and desire to do this that we were able to get polar bears listed as the first species on that list due to climate change. And that was a really big deal. And that just shows you that one person leading the charge like that can have a huge impact in the world. And I think it's just an inspiration for all of us. Well, thank you, Elise. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. <laughs> but except that I would say that, that uh, you know, I have always had great teams of people working with me. And I've been really feeling privileged to be on the PBI team because uh, we have been doing remarkable things in terms of getting the word out, in terms of communicating, and uh, in terms of doing more research that will help us provide more information uh, that will inspire people to uh, change their ways so that we can indeed achieve the climate goals that we're interested in. Yeah, yeah Steve, Steve, really, you are a great example of a well-rounded approach to this because, you know, Steve's clearly with us, with us right now doing this educational program. Steve is a research scientist and Steve also pushes for policy changes and no single one of those things can really protect polar bears for the long term. We need different approaches as is true for any kind of protection. Uh, and it's very inspiring to see all of those in one place. And, you know, obviously at this, you know, this space right here, the, the United Nations, this is the highest level of collaboration that really happens uh, across humanity. But communities and people all the world have a role to play in addressing climate change. And Elisa, I wondered, you know, we just gave this example of Steve. I wonder if you could give us some other examples of how people and those viewing can help polar bears and can help animate climate action. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Polar bears can seem quite a distant species for a lot of us, but I think they're so connected to our world. The Arctic sea ice that polar bears depend on cools our entire planet, and so really what's happening to polar bears is happening to us. So we can help though, there's ways we can get involved, and the best things that we can do is use our voice and our votes to make change. So we can use our voice by talking about it, by talking about polar bears or climate change, or maybe you have a forest you love to visit or a house by the beach that you wanna make sure is protected. There are things that matter in your life, and by talking about how you want that to stay safe, we're going to shift the societal discourse and we're going to change the conversations and make it more acceptable and really push that forward. And then with votes, votes can be your money. What are you buying? What kind of companies are you supporting? But then, of course, your votes for your leaders. So Steve is one type of leader, but leaders in your community, if you're old enough to vote, but even if you're not, you can still write letters. You can influence your elected leaders. You know, it's a great uh, thing at school to do to Check out who your elected leader is and see if you can write an email and kind of push that change. It is especially so important for youth that are underrepresented in the political landscape and those that are going to be some of the first impacted by climate change. Your voices matter so much more than you know, and we really, really can make a big change in our society for a protected future for people and for polar bears. We completely have this shared future together, and our actions today are going to decide what the future looks like, just like Steve is talking about. So the, the societal features that, that Elisa was just talking about are really key. It used to be that, that uh, we thought of conservation as people like like me, like Elisa, running around on the, on the ground in rubber boots and tagging animals and doing things like that, building fences uh, to protect particular habitats. Uh, but we can't build a fence to protect the sea ice from rising temperatures. Conservation has become more than anything a societal action. It's up to all of us. If we want to have polar bears around, if we want to have the other wild creatures that we appreciate, we need to act together to do it. And the ways that uh, Elisa was just talking about, uh, communicating with your friends, your youth group, your church, your whatever, whatever groups you're involved in, don't be afraid to talk about the fact that we need to change our ways if we're going to save uh, polar bears and uh, many of the other creatures that we care about. Mm -hmm. And so much of it is finding the community around you. The, and that could be anything. That could be at your school. It could be a sports team. It could be you know, a group of just like-minded individuals. But finding a group of people, it's not all on your shoulders. We really do need to work together. And ultimately, it's about reducing carbon emissions. And we've had some great examples of youth uh, petitioning their school districts that the next school bus they buy is going to be electric. It seems small, but those sorts of things start this tsunami of change. And we really get this momentum going. So, you know. Talk and find your people. And I can add in that from this experience here, observing some of the youth, you know, there's there's opportunities to engage on every single level. And so Elisa gave some great examples of the level. And if you're interested in this space, there are a lot of youth here that end up participating. So there's a conference of youth that happens before every single uh, COP for the UN Climate Talks. And as part of that, a group of young people come together and they uh, write a formal request that is then submitted to uh, the UN Secretary and to those overseeing the conference so that those requests are incorporated as part of the consideration for things like what do you talk about at the conference when everyone gets together and, and who's talking to who and you know, what are the goals that you want to see accomplished? So young people are helping, you know, write and request some of those and, and definitely putting pressure on world leaders. And beyond that, too, I mean, I've seen, I've met a lot of young people that are a part of their country's negotiating delegation. Uh, on, the, on the journey here, I met, uh, I guess, let's see, a 21-year-old who's part of the American negotiating, negotiating delegation. Uh, I met a young person that's part of the Dominican Republic negotiating team, uh, the uh, Panama negotiating team. So that's quite impressive. And then on the other side of that, there's also civil society that engage in this space in the way that we really are, which is advocating for the things that are important to us in the future that we want.
Can you still hear me? Yeah, I think you just cut out for a second there, but we have you okay. back. Okay, okay. great. <laughs> um, excellent. excellent. Well, I guess I'm. Well, I well, let's take a quick pause because I just saw a, a question come in, and I think that we should we should go to it. So I'm going to kick it to you, Steve. Uh, somebody would like to know how many months are the bears on shore at this time? The, uh, the time that bears are on shore right now, of course, depends from one year to the next on the weather. You know, even as the world is warming, we're still going to have the fluctuations in uh, the weather. Some years will be cooler, some years will be warmer, but all of those fluctuations will be over a higher and rising baseline. But what we're seeing is that the bears here in Hudson Bay are on shore for about a month longer than they used to be. Between the, the ice melting earlier in the summertime and freezing up later in the wintertime. It happens that this year we had a late breakup compared to recent breakups. So it was more like the normal breakup from 20 years ago or so. Uh, and that means that the bears that we're seeing right now have not been on shore as long as say last year or the year before and so most of the bears we've been seeing are actually in pretty good shape yeah. and we so we just had a couple of big males out here that were sparring and they were among the fattest uh, bears i've seen in the fall for a long long time yeah. pretty chunky yeah yeah that's exciting that's um that's a little you know varies year to year but that's definitely a little piece of hope it's nice to hear and I think it would be nice, I mean, if you two are interested, I would love on the topic of hope. Uh, you know, we're speaking a lot about collective action. So everybody is, is unique roles that we can take, no matter what our age is, no matter where we live, no matter what community we are in. And Steve and Elisa, I would love uh, to hear from both of you about what what piece of you know greater collective action that's that's happening at any scale gives you hope for polar bear point well i'll, I'll start with yeah. that so uh, there first. is oh, no, positive <laughs> action going on at a variety of levels and one of the big pieces that we could talk about is the kigali amendment to the montreal protocol uh, that was just passed by the u.s uh, congress Oh, what, a month and a half ago, I suppose? And it deals with not CO2, but with other very important greenhouse gases that were kind of overlooked in the uh, uh, Montreal Protocol. And of course, the Montreal Protocol was about the ozone layer, but those gases that were causing diminishing ozone also, many of them happen to be very strong greenhouse gases. And uh, so they kind of have been uh, policy leaders have been dragging their feet on doing something about these uh, gases and we just passed uh, legislation to deal with them uh, about a month and a half ago in the U.S. Congress and that was uh, an agreement that already had been approved by most of the other nations that had signed the Montreal Protocol Agreement. So that was a big step forward and I'm looking for more steps forward from our policy leaders as we go forward. Mm -hmm. And for me, something is the youth action we're seeing around the world. Uh, for example, in the UK, 100 universities pulled out of investing in fossil fuels and reinvested in cleaner energies. And that movement was driven by student campaigns. Again, students finding their community and their voices and getting together to pressure these institutions to make changes. And you know, we hear a lot these days about climate anxiety and the good news is that we know what the problem is. We know the problem is burning too many fossil fuels. That means we know what the solution is. And we can turn this anxiety into action. And I think for some people, especially young people, there's some climate anger. It's very frustrating when these leaders at these big conferences keep saying they're going to make changes and they're not. And we really have the power to put some pressure on them, turn that anger and anxiety into action. And if we all do it together, we will make change. It's not on the shoulders of youth to fix what other generations broke, but we can get those generations to make better fixes so our, again, our shared future is protected. We're going to have a shared future that's protected for ourselves and our children and our children's children and the same for polar bears to keep them in the Arctic. 
great answers both. Um, those are excellent, kind of hard to top that. But I will add, I guess from this experience right now, kind of looking around, I think even though I couldn't agree more that on a global level, uh, it's glacial, glacially slow <laughs> action is <laughs> for climate is glacially slow. And also I see a lot of really impressive global collaboration around. And while that's imperfect and messy, it also has the potential to be very powerful. And it is very powerful in a lot of senses and very real. And uh, the, the neat thing about this space is uh, frustrating as it can be to see how slowly things move in the face of uh, urgent, uh, urgent circumstances is just the number of people that are, are working so, so hard in the corner and the piece of the world that means a lot to them. And you think about, you know, how many people are doing that all over and that, that creates a, a tremendous sense of light and hope for me. We do have a couple of more questions that have come in. So let's see, I am going, let's see. Alisa, how many polar bears are there and do you keep track of them? We do keep track of them. Uh, polar bears are extremely hard to study. You know, they live in some of the most remote, harshest places on the planet. But this population we're in right now is called the Western Hudson Bay Polar Bear Population around Churchill, Manitoba. The entire population used to be about 1,200 polar bears in the 1980s. We're closer to about 800 polar bears now, and that decline is linked to the loss of sea ice. But even though there's still 800 bears around, we're not going to see them all right here in buggy land. The coast is quite spread out, and so are the bears. So we see a select few bears uh, kind of walking in and out of this area or just hanging out. Some seem to find the buggies quite interesting. Uh, so today, how many bears have we seen today, Steve? Three, four, five, five six, seven. Oh, yeah. And yeah, seven. Yeah. Seven, yeah, so seven polar yeah. bears today. So if you're watching our polar bear cams on explore.org, you can expect at this time of the year to see a good number of polar bears and some pretty fun polar bear action. So it's a great way to kind of connect with what the bears are doing. And I think that they're kind of enjoying the fresh snow, too. It yeah. looks like they are, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would add uh, that, uh, you know, people often want to know, well, how many polar bears are there in the whole world? And that's a much more difficult question. Scientists have sort of put their heads together and said, well, there's about 26,000 polar bears worldwide. But that estimate is a mixture of really solid estimates like we have here in Western Hudson Bay or in the Beaufort Sea of Alaska where I did my work. So it's a mixture of those good estimates and a lot of populations that we just don't have very good estimates for. And so you could think of it as a combination of really solid estimates and wild ass guesses to give us uh, you know, a, a 26,000 estimate. Uh, but the important thing to think about is that all over their range, uh, polar bears are threatened by the loss of sea ice. In some places farther north from here, they haven't started to feel the impact yet, but if we continue to warm the world at the rate we've been warming it, uh, we ultimately will lose all of that sea ice. So. Uh, how many bears there are now isn't really the issue. And that was the key to the uh, listing of the polar bear as threatened under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. Polar bears weren't listed because of their current status, which is usually the case for the way the ESA is applied. Uh, they were listed because of the potential for their future status to decline because of human-caused global warming. And Steve, maybe you could uh, clarify for people that might be new to polar bears, what is it about loss of sea ice that results in declining population? What is that link there? Well, so uh, polar bears feed on two species of seals, and those are what we call ice-loving seals. And they live out here in Hudson Bay and, and all across the range of the polar bear, and they depend on the ecosystem on the underside mm -hmm. of the sea ice. So the underside of sea ice is very different than freshwater ice. Freshwater ice, the bottom and the top looks about the same, but the, the underside of sea ice is just this like miniature mountain range with peaks and valleys and uh, crevices. And in those spaces is a whole variety of other organisms, algae, fungi, uh, small shrimp-like creatures, uh, small fish, and ultimately the seals feed on those and then the polar bears feed on the seals. So everything out here is really tied to the sea ice surface 
And uh, if that sea ice goes away, uh, that's the loss of the habitat, not only that polar bears walk around on to catch their prey, but the uh, habitat that supports them. Recent studies by some of our Canadian colleagues have shown that 86% of the carbon that enters a polar bear's body comes from the ecosystem on the underside of the ice. I mean, if Very you take cool. that away, uh, you don't have enough to support the bears. Right. This truly is an ice bear. This is the only marine bear of all eight bear species. And without this frozen ocean, they can't survive on land. And what is, what exactly causes climate change? We have someone asking that. So uh, maybe, Alisa, will you take us through that? Oh, we're I'll, I'll give. A, I'll yeah. take a crack at that. Um, so basically, you know the uh, we have the the light from the sun coming in, carrying energy that that warms the earth, and that comes in in the form of shortwave radiation. And shortwave radiation penetrates the atmosphere without interference. It hits the ground. It warms the ground. It warms us. It warms uh, the trees. It warms everything. Um, but then that energy has to escape back into space. And it escapes back into space in the form of long wave radiation. Greenhouse gases, like CO2, mm -hmm. slow the escape of that energy back into space. And if we have a stable CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, which is what we've had for most of the last million years, uh, we, that energy eventually does escape into space at the same rate as it's coming in. Uh, however, the, uh, uh, with the situation that we have it, concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere chronically increasing, the uh, rate at which that energy stays around the lower atmosphere is increasing and less energy is escaping into space. So we're basically out of, out of energy balance with space is what it is. So uh, we're getting more energy in in the form of shortwave radiation that's warming the world, but the long wave radiation that needs to escape back into space isn't getting there in time to prevent us from steadily warming. Good answer. I knew you would know the answer, Steve. Um, someone else would like to know where else polar bears live other than where you two are right now. Yeah, I'll start and then Steve can fill in some details. So polar bears do live across the circumpolar Arctic. They're found in five countries. So Canada, where we are here, the U.S. and Alaska, as well as Russia, Greenland, and Norway. Now polar bears prefer to roam over what we call the continental shelf. That's where the ocean is a little bit uh, less deep. So it's more shallow and that means it's more productive. So all that life that Steve was talking about, the light is getting through the ice, there's more fish, there's more seals, and that's where the polar bears are. So though we might have polar bears at the North Pole, probably not so much because there's not a lot of food there. And then Steve has worked extensively in other areas of the Arctic and particularly in Alaska. Yeah, and we had a graduate student that did some work uh, on a, a big NSF grant a few years ago and he showed, in fact, what the point that Elisa just made that in the deep polar basin, like right over the North Pole, the water is very deep. Mm -hmm. Any life that happens to be at the bottom of the ice sinks to the right. bottom of the ocean and isn't and is lost to the ecosystem. But more importantly, the ice has been heavy. A little a little light penetrates through it. Very very small amounts of light. It's just not very productive there. And John, this graduate student who is now on staff <laughs> at Polar Bears International, I'm happy to say. Uh, he showed that the bears that move out into the deep polar basin following the remaining ice aren't feeding. So whether they come ashore uh, when the ice goes away or go way offshore into the distant pack ice, in either case, they're food deprived. Right, so Santa isn't likely bumping into many <laughs> polar bears up there. Yeah, yeah, the cartoons with Santa and polar bears are a little less than realistic. <laughs> For a couple reasons, yeah. yeah. And, and so, so where you two are right now on the shore of the Hudson Bay, can you see any ice? Is the bay close to freezing up? Alisa? Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're no, not I seeing much. I'll let Steve take perfect. this. I'm not, he's probably had a good look at those ice maps lately. There, there's a little bit of, of ice forming. It's mostly like slush yeah. that's being blown in against the shoreline here. Uh, one of the things about the Hudson Bay or about the Churchill area 
is that the, the circulation of the ocean in Hudson Bay the, is counterclockwise. So that means that on the western side of the bay where we are, the ice is flowing uh, as it forms north of here, where it's a little cooler, it tends to form south, uh, or form north and then drift to the south. And as it's drifting south, it hits this little uh, horizontal east-west shelf that runs between the town of Churchill and Cape Churchill. And so this is one of the first places that the ice kind of hangs up and, and uh, gathers. And that's why the bears have always sort of hung out in this area because it's one of the first places they can get back onto the ice. But as of yet, there isn't enough ice for them to really take advantage of. I will say at least the little ponds have frozen up by now. So the ponds don't mean anything for polar bears, but they do kind of like to walk across the ponds. And we were lucky enough to see what we call a polar bear starfish recently. So that's when a big polar bear is kind of testing the ice and has to really distribute its weight with its big paws and spread out along the ice and do a bit of a shuffle along these frozen ponds so they don't fall in. And it always kind of makes us laugh and it's nice to see uh, they're not getting anything out of the pond ice, but seeing a, a polar bear on the ice is always great. So we're waiting patiently for this ice to come, freeze up again, just like these polar bears are. And yeah, keeping an eye out every day. Yes, I hope it comes soon for the sake of that sleepy bear keep showing on the cam. Uh, Steve, what is the average age of most polar bears? Oh, we must have a little delay. So Steve and I just keep interrupting. Apologies. Well, we, we can move on to your question. Uh, um, the average age of a polar bear is kind of a, you know, it's a, as a, in any population, if you were to say, well, what's the average age of the population? It's the little ones and the old ones and what's the average of that that's kind of a of a difficult question to answer without having the numbers right in front of you but what we can say is that typically male bears don't live as long as female bears because they tend to be you know fighting each other uh, competing with each other all their lives in order to uh, secure breeding opportunities females live a little bit longer even though they're putting more energy into reproduction uh, so the average or the, you know, the, the longevity of male bears is usually into the 20 to 24 age group. Some of them will live longer, but most of them are pretty worn out by the time they hit 20. Females, on the other hand, can live into the mid to late 20s. And, and in our work in, uh, uh, in Alaska, we had a couple of bears that were in the neighborhood of 33 years. Wow. And um, the, in captivity, uh, bears and zoos can often live longer. And in the Winnipeg Zoo, just south of here, how old was? Uh, 42. 42. That, yeah. yeah. That's what I was thinking. So they had a bear that died just two years ago, I think, that was uh, 42 years old when she, uh, when she uh, met, met her end. And uh, so that, you know, they can live a long time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, what? What was her name? Debbie? Debbie, Debbie the bear. bear. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. And one more question. Actually, I think we have two more, unless anyone else submits anything else. Um, Alisa, I'll give this one to you. Uh, someone asked, I have heard about the heat trapping blanket metaphor. Can you explain? metaphors to kind of help explain concepts that can, you know, be a little difficult. And the heat trapping blanket metaphor is a really simple way to talk about kind of climate warming. So when we burn fossil fuels, we release carbon emissions into the atmosphere. And those emissions act like a heat trapping blanket. In regular amounts, that's okay. You know, our atmosphere can handle that. We can stay warm. But the problem is that we've been burning rampant amounts of fossil fuels and releasing rampant carbon emissions into the atmosphere. So basically, we had this nice blanket around Earth, and now we've made it way too thick. So we're trapping too much heat in the atmosphere. It can't escape. And when we trap too much heat, of course, ice is going to melt. That's pretty straightforward. So that's kind of what we're seeing, just that's a very simplified version of what Steve was talking about earlier. But it really is that simple. You know, we're burning the wrong sorts of fuels. We have fuels from nature. We have solar power. We have wind power. We have water power. Let's use them. Let's switch to more of those energies to be much cleaner and, you know, stop burning so many fossil fuels. We need to get our atmosphere back on track. And from some of Steve's work, we know that once we get a handle on carbon emissions, 
you know, we can protect sea ice, and sea ice even will bounce back at some point, but we know it's very responsive. It is not too late. Yeah, our work showed that uh, there's a linear but inverse relationship between global mean temperature and sea ice extent. So as the temperature rises, uh, sea ice declines. It doesn't decline in the form, in the shape of a cliff. There's no major threshold between temperature and sea ice. Warmer it gets, less sea ice. If it's cooler, if we're able to cool the climate back, we would have more sea ice. And uh, so that's an important thing to keep in mind that we do have the ability to fix this. You know, we, uh, we started using fossil fuels uh, 150 years ago or so, and societies have benefited from them. We can't deny that we have taken advantage of fossil fuels. But now that we know the side effect of using those fossil fuels is warming the world to the point where uh, we're actually destroying the habitats that we depend on and that the polar bears depend on, uh, we need to change our ways. So. We know that we're responsible. We know that we can mm -hmm. uh, make the changes that we need to make. And you know, we progressed on the ozone layer. We helped fix the ozone layer. Not perfect, but we did so much work and we really did change society pr to protect that. And that's just one example of how we really can shift what we're doing in terms of our energy uh, to protect our future. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, another example is uh, uh, acid rain Right. from uh, 20 years ago or so. Uh, lakes in the northeastern United States and uh, uh, southern Canada were uh, becoming totally sterile because they were so acidic because of smokestack emissions. And similarly, forests were dying. And we agreed to have a, 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 a basically a treaty, an agreement between the U.S. and Canada to uh, halt our emissions so that... Uh, uh, we would stop this acid rain, and indeed we did stop it. Uh, another one is asbestos. Years ago, mm -hmm. we discovered that asbestos can protect us from fires. Then we didn't know that breathing in the fibers of asbestos is really bad for us. But now that we know that, we're so much more careful in how we use asbestos than we used to be. So we have these examples. What we need to do is apply them on the global society scale and uh, make that difference that we need. Exactly. We can do it. Yes. Yes, we have the knowledge, we have the tools, and we know that everyone watching this webcast has an interest in some element of this and, and your own expertise and your own powers. And this kind of leads to our final question. Uh, and I would love to hear probably from both of you, so I'll, I'll kick it to you first, Steve, but can a single individual really make a difference for polar bears and how so? I think it's, it's really important to think about what each of us can do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it used to be a few years ago, uh, you'd hear people say, well, you know, if you turn off your lights before you, uh, as you leave the room, if you turn the thermostat down in the wintertime, that sort of thing. Those are really important things for us to think about because we should all be thinking about using energy more carefully. But in terms of really making a difference, the things that we need to do are about our communication with others, trying to get our social groups together to act, trying to get our communities together, and ultimately influencing our policymakers. Uh, we need to have policy leadership that will take us uh, in the right path. And how do we do that? Well, uh, directly, we can do it by uh, voting for people who have actually said they care about our future and they care about our children's future, uh, but also supporting businesses that have a right to have, the, have a business model that is sustainable so that we can uh, vote with our dollars as well as uh, vote uh, with our ballots. Those are the things that are most important for individuals to do. Certainly, we want to take mass transit wherever we can. We want to uh, uh, turn down the thermostat. We want to do all of those things. But we are so far beyond simple solutions that we really need to focus on societal actions. And each of us has a role in our society. 
think Steve really summed that up beautifully, but every individual has power. We all have a different set of skills, a different set of interests, different abilities, depending on where we are in life. But by tapping into your community and finding your team, whatever that team looks like, of people made up with different skills, but the same goal, we really can make a difference, truly. And it starts with talking about it. So I would just encourage you, especially if you are in school right now, talk to your classmates about this, talk to your teacher, uh, look up, you know, we've got Google these days. Google, what you know, what's going on at COP? What's going on with polar bears? Just learn, ask questions, stay curious, and you know, stay active. This is your future just as much as it's the polar bears, and we want all of us to have a protected future. Beautiful, you too. I, I think the only thing I would add is I, it can feel very heavy to 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 believe it's an individual responsibility to address these really big challenges and of course you know we we often all do and i think it's important to remind ourselves while you know what we do as individuals matter we are so much stronger when we collaborate and when we you know can scale our work and our ideas with other people and so while it's important to ask what can i really do i think it's also important to ask where can i or can I collaborate with people? Where are there people that care about this? And can I get involved with them? Because when we are able to spend time with people that care about the same things, we can do so much more than we could ever do it. I think this is the last question as far as I can tell. And I think it's a really important uh, note to leave on because this is really the purpose of this conversation is that Nobody needs to go about their journey of, of addressing climate warming or advocating for something you care about in any one specific way. There are thousands upon thousands, probably millions of ways you can do it. And so find what resonates with you, find what feels natural for your skill set. And we are here at Polar Bears International to support you because we really know that it takes uh, all ways of being and all kinds of action to, to move the things forward so that we can become and strengthen our stewardship of this planet that we all depend on. And with that, I think we will say goodbye. Uh, Alisa and Steve, thank you so much for joining me here in Egypt uh, from the shores of Hudson Bay. It's really delightful to get to connect with you two in this way. Uh, and then thank you to everyone behind the scenes at Polar Bears International. I know uh, both BJ and KT are likely back there uh, helping share all these awesome visuals that you've been seeing. Uh, and to awesome Marisa, who's been helping us with all of the chat and everybody else that's contributed. This is, as you can tell that you may see three of us up here, but this is, you know, as I said, collaborate with people because it takes a team always. Uh, and we hope that you have a great rest of your day wherever you are in the world. And thank you so much for being a part of this work with us. Thanks, Emily. Thank you, Emily. It's been great. Future generations of people and polar bears depend on the decisions and plans that we make today. A polar bear's life cycle is almost exclusively tied to the sea ice. Because polar bears rely on sea ice to hunt, to breed, and sometimes to den, sea ice loss from climate change is their biggest threat, and the reason the bears are listed as vulnerable on the IUCN's red list of threatened species. What we learn about climate change impacts on polar bears in Hudson Bay can be applied across the Arctic to help conserve other populations. Climate change is already affecting some populations of polar bears. Since we get most of our energy from fossil fuels, we are producing huge amounts of carbon dioxide. You see regular amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere act like a blanket around the Earth, trapping heat and keeping our planet at a stable temperature. However, when we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas for energy, we pump rampant amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This buildup thickens the blanket, trapping too much heat, disrupting the climate, and melting Arctic sea ice. When Arctic waters are cold enough, the top layer freezes into a special type of ice called sea ice. Sea ice is to the ocean what soil is to a forest. 
it supports the entire Arctic food chain. Food from this marine ecosystem also sustains northern communities. The key to getting the climate back to functioning the way it should, and to preserving a future for polar bears across the Arctic, is to move away from using fossil fuels for energy altogether. The most important thing we can do is vote with the climate in mind to let our leaders know we support a swift transition to renewable energy sources. In the meantime, we can directly participate in and learn more about our local and regional renewable energy options. We can all make a difference outside our own households by influencing where our energy comes from. Because together, we can make sure that polar bears roam the Arctic sea ice for generations to come.